put forth. But Tommy puts his heart and soul into this movie, for both better and worse. But you don't have to take my word on it. I pulled a 5-star review and a 1-star review from the annals of the internet for you. And since this 5-star review is posted over 10 different times on 10 different accounts, I'm sure someone really wants you to read it. So, I guess multiple sources agree. Quote, Tommy Wiseau, unrivaled directorial debut, Room, is masterpiece and one of most underappreciated films of modern era. Every line and scene has much care and effort put in that easily puts many far more ambitious films to shame. Its character writing is outstanding, and every line feels genuine and carries emotional weight. Film features excellent and devoted cast, including fantastic performance from Greg Sestero and Juliet Daniel, though every role brilliantly portrayed. The story is marvelous feat and storytelling with intricate, compelling narrative that will keep you enthralled. Intensely suspenseful cliffhangers and heart-stopping ending. Anyone who's seen it know this only modicum of heartfelt genius that make Room easily greatest film of all time. End quote. Just for everyone's knowledge, I did make sure and include all the grammatical errors that were present in that particular entry. Now, I, I will say, some of them were a little bit cleaner grammatically, but they all were almost word for word the same. So, people really agree on this particular point about what fantastic performances and emotional weight this film gave the world. Also, shout out to Joshua D for just posting five stars with Smash Mouth lyrics attached. That's an all-star review, Josh. See what I did there? I threw it back at you. Ball's in your court now, Joshua D. All right, so let's get on to a one-star review, shall we? You, you know what the problem is when I uh, try and find one-star reviews? Hmm, the one-star reviews are all fake. The Room is an underrated masterpiece of filmmaking. It has great acting, great cinematography, great soundtrack, great production design, and it is a movie that you will surely love. It is a rom-com movie that will be enjoyed by people of all ages. It goes on like this. Wazo is genius because his flawless human acting skills are clear in there. The emotions that you will feel when he says, Oh, hi, Mark, are innumerable. Wazo also has great writing skills. Okay, so I'm sure there is a real one here. So, let me see. The Room is one of the biggest atrocities I've ever seen. It has random, incoherent scripts, atrocious acting, sloppy framing, and a non-existent story, with unintentionally hilarious dialogue. It fails on every base level of filmmaking, but oh man, is it funny. Most bad movies are forgotten because of how forgettable they are, but The Room is so inept and so random and so bizarre that it managed just to achieve cult status. I think that's a pretty decent one-star review. Uh, there were other ones that were more negative, but not any ones that were fun, and I assure you, they were just single one, two, or three word dismissions of the movie. If you're not going to write at least a solid paragraph blasting a movie, then unfortunately your review is not likely to get posted here. So before we get into it, and spoiler territory, if you haven't seen it yet, go and watch this movie. The Room is available on DVD and Blu-ray at streetfashionusa.com as well as tommywazo.com as well as Amazon, and it's currently streaming on YouTube. So all my bad movie fans, let's sit back, let's pop ourselves some popcorn, and let's get ready for this six million dollar dumpster fire of a movie. High five! Jeez, that's not cranberry sauce! Don't watch me! <laughs> so we start off The Room with some nice kind of establishment shots during the opening segment of the Bay Area, and we've got some light classical pan fusion playing in the background as one will, and it, it, it starts to sound a little Zelda-y about halfway through. Honestly, I... I've watched this a couple times and I always wonder like how much this opening segment costs because there's several aerial shots and it seems pretty well done. We do get our first shot of Tommy here as he rides the trolley home to give Lisa her red dress of course. He comes in through the door and gives her a present and we pretty much get this almost every single time that Tommy comes home where he is he's always giving Lisa something because he's such a nice guy. We really need to establish what a nice guy Tommy is. So Johnny comes in, he gives Lisa the, the red dress, and they start to get a little bit kissy and sexy time, and that's when Denny just barges through the door completely unannounced. And Denny, by the way, is their somewhat nice, kinda creepy neighbor of completely undefined age. He seems to me like maybe 16, 17 at best. He's supposedly of college age, so you know, I guess take of that what you will. So Johnny, he makes a sexy time excuse, and he says he's gonna go upstairs and take a nap. Denny, he immediately asks if 
but he can go upstairs too, which Lisa tells him that she thinks she's going to be joining Johnny for his nap, which is just kind of her way of telling him off, which Danny completely does not catch. They walk off upstairs, going up the staircase, and Danny, he just kind of watches them weirdly from the living room, and he grabs himself an apple right off the, the table, and he, he just takes like a, a big old bite of that apple. Uh, well, he just stares him, stares him down as they go upstairs. So he, he takes a bite of the apple, and then apparently he follows them upstairs because we transition over to Johnny and Lisa having a sexy pillow fight, which is, I don't, I don't know who has sexy pillow fight for foreplay, but yeah. So we have sexy pillow fight, and then Denny comes into the room, and he grabs himself a pillow, and he tries to join in, and it quickly kills the mood. Johnny and Lisa try and tell him, you know, that it's, it's time for him to go, and <laughs> Denny, he, he just blatantly admits, you know, that he's like, I just like to watch. This is about four minutes into the movie while we're having our first sex scene and our first instance of Denny just being a total pervert. There'll be more of that. And in case it's it's your first time watching, his name actually is Denny, like the restaurant, which I've had a long-standing discussion over whether this naming confusion was due to the restaurant or not. Denny is, in fact, such an uncommon name. I had to search the Social Security website to see if it's even used in the United States, and that's when I found out that they only keep digital records of the thousand most common names in any given year. So, because there are only records of the thousand most common names in any given year, there's no record of the name Denny going all the way back until 1989. That's when it was the 937th most common name in the U.S. It peaked out in popularity around 1947, coming in at the 325th most common name in the U.S., and it, it never has even come close to the top 100 territory. So, I kind of assume this is just a... A naming issue with Tommy where he doesn't necessarily understand that most people aren't named Denny, they're named, like, Danny. Denny's is, is usually kind of thought of as a restaurant, but in this case we're talking about Denny. And Denny, he apparently likes to watch. So as I was watching and, you know, looking up the name, I started to notice Denny has really short scenes. So, just for your pleasure, I've timed out all of the Denny scenes. Because right now, Denny comes in at under two minutes in this scene. Just long enough to say hi and invade some personal space, really, before Lisa can tell them off so they can continue that awkwardly sexually charged pillow fight that they were having. Thankfully, Denny does take off and leaves to do some homework before we're treated to a weird sex scene with I Will by Wyman Davis playing in the background and I've, ju I've just got to say it is a particularly bad song and it is very jarring to watch two half-naked people clumsily roll around to. So we transition to the next morning where Johnny, you know, he asked Lisa if she'd liked last night which um, I guess, you know, she says she did so box is checked, mission accomplished, off to work. But but as soon as Johnny leaves, Lisa's mom, Claudette, immediately comes in through the door. This is our first time seeing Lisa's mom. Her name's Claudette, and she's a weird one. Anywho, Johnny's just left to work, and Lisa is just about immediately dropping the ball that she no longer loves Johnny. And I just got, there's nothing to announce this. There's nothing to indicate prior to this that she's not in love with Johnny, and we are only four and a half minutes into the film at this point, where we really drop the big storyline that Lisa no longer loves Johnny, and she suddenly feels the need to leave him. But we do learn a little bit more about their whole mother-daughter dynamic here. You see, Lisa's mom seems way down with Johnny. She seems super into him, or like at least his money, because she rants on about how secure he is at his job. He's bought Lisa a car, he's bought her clothes, you know, he's... He bought her a ring, he's gonna buy her a house, and he's gonna be getting a promotion very soon. Her mom basically just throws a no to the whole discussion, telling Lisa that she should marry Johnny instead of leaving him, and then then she dips. You know, and that's that's Claudette. Short little scenes with awkward dialogue mixed in with plenty of praise for a potential son-in-law. Meanwhile, Lisa is just immediately getting down to business. Uh, and she picks up the phone, she dials up Johnny's best friend, and she just starts to hit him up in the most awkward kind of dialogue I've ever heard, where she instantly just leads in with, hey baby, what's going on? And it's it's so damn awkward. And he's just like, hey, I'm very busy, what is it? 
You know, the acting direction on this scene is really confusing because it seems like Juliet Daniels seems to be acting under the direction they're having an active affair, where Greg Sestero's character has this whole, like, who dis vibe to him, and it doesn't even feel like they're speaking to one another. You know, Lisa, she... She tells Mark how she's been talking to her mom and how she's bored. And Mark, he just doesn't seem to get what Lisa's hinting at. Even though Lisa is, you know, saying, come on, you owe me one. Like they have had prior arrangements before, which Mark seems to make no connection with whatsoever. But when she asks him to come over tomorrow, he does you know, begrudgingly agree, I guess, you know. So somehow these two space aliens do manage to arrange a play date. So Greg comes over like he he promised, right? And he walks in the door and Lisa just immediately puts hands on him and sets him down in a in a chair that she has placed inside the doorway and just she just grabs him a glass of wine. To me, all this is just awkward. I I don't know how you seduce someone. We all have our methods, but if someone was to invite me to their apartment and just sit me down auspiciously in this chair that they had just placed just inside the doorway and then handed me a glass of wine just before they declared how hot it is, you know, and then they start taking off their clothes, like, you didn't need to hand me a glass of wine to prove that it's hot. I, I, if you say it's hot, I will just nod and agree to whatever temperature you say it is. If this person was then to start to undress like she is, I'm pretty sure we would we we would dip. Not Mark though. No, uh, Mark. He he lets Lisa sit him down. She says it's hot. Uh, she asks if it's okay to to take off some clothing. He just kind of nods, so she does. Then she just passionately caresses his wrist. Yeah, just like finger in his wrist. And then she sits down on his lap and just starts in on, like, don't you like me? I'm your girl? (sighs) She says, I'm your girl. And he's like, Johnny's my best friend. I don't don't know if Lisa had a relationship maybe with Mark's twin or somebody who looked a lot like Mark. But there just seems to be confusion. Maybe these two people came from two different but very close realities, right? Like, there was a crossover between two parallel universes. And in one of them, the one Lisa's from, they were actually having an affair. And the one Mark is from, they're just friends, and he barely knows her at all. And so there's just this confusion, and Lisa's just not even paying attention, and she just barrels through it until she gets to that that Greg Sestero abs, you know, because that's really the goal for all of us, I think. That being said, she doesn't seem to have any long-term plans laid out here. She just seems to be into the pursuit, the awkward, clumsily half-drunken pursuit, more than actually knowing what she's doing. I think she just likes to stir the pot. Which she, she probably gets from her mom, Claudette. But her mom, Claudette, being much older and wiser and having already destroyed the lives of several men in her life, has wisened up. She knows the value of money. Not... Not really a great family. I mean, they do plenty to establish why Johnny is such a good guy. He always just brings home gifts and says nice things and lets anyone just stroll into his apartment in this me casa su casa sort of way. And he has this ambiguously great job that we never get to know any more about than like he's a banker. And he has all this money and he's definitely not a movie surrogate for Tommy Wiseau or anything like that. And I don't understand why this guy is so emotionally dependent on this weirdly average girl and her terrible 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 family but apparently they they've been together for five years according to the plot at this point and it's all been sunshine and roses and that's just right after when tommy gave her the red dress they had fun sexy time but that was that was the last sexy time she was ever going to enjoy with johnny she is now bored and moving on but uh let's get back to lisa and mark so lisa proclaims love and she asks for sex and mark is just like nah Rinse and repeat this a few times before she finally manages to stumble into a libido list kiss that could turn water into sand, and honestly she should feel really guilty about it because poor Johnny is out right now buying her flowers. So Johnny rolls up into this flower shop in his bins. He goes inside, he says hi, he asks for a dozen roses, says hi to the dog, the shop owner tells him the price, he gives her a 20, tells her to keep the change, and leaves. And what's so amazing to me about this scene, really, is that 
He manages to make it in and out of this florist shop in 16 seconds. I mean, this is a snappy scene. This guy, he's a romantic, he spies her gifts, he's so efficient, and he's got such a stable job. <laughs> like, what's not to love about Yami? I really enjoy that he's got a very stable job line, by the way. I'm over-invested into Claudette and Yami's relationship, and I like to theorize as to why she knows all these details about him. I mean, we...